So my talk is about distributed FPGA number crunching for the masses. What a title. Um, so let's start with the number crunching part of it. So it's a valid question to ask who is still doing number crunching these days. I mean, breaking keys is nice, but hasn't everybody moved to 128-bit encryption now, AES and so on? Yeah, most stuff has moved, but it turns out there's plenty of stuff that's still unsolved that has been encrypted with, um, like, DES, and where we still don't know the key. And it's, there are some interesting things to work on that still require number crunching action. So um, DES, of course, as I said, is a classic example of brute forcing keys. People have done that. Um, it's a 56-bit key space, so it's manageable. Um, there are some synthetic problems, like the, the N-Queens problem. People are trying to solve this using FPGAs. Um, the distributed net OGR project, and a couple of other things. But for a talk, um, let's focus on a real-world example. So this device is a Triforce arcade machine. It's something that's hidden in an arcade cabinet in the end. So this is where the actual game is working on. It's a modified GameCube. It doesn't matter so much. So inside this thing, um, there's also a dedicated processor that's, happy, that's doing security stuff and some management stuff and so on. And a certain version of these Triforces have a thing called... Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. So the games have been dumped and emulated. You can run them in an emulator today, similar to MAME. It's a different emulator, but it works. But there's still one unsolved mystery. And um, if we look closer... One of the files that run on this machine is a file called firmware.asic, and it's obviously encrypted if you look at it. And so far, nobody really knows what this file is supposed to do. We know it's some kind of a firmware, and we know about what it's supposed to do, but it's encrypted, so we can't really do much here. Um, if you look a little bit closer, you see this repeating 8-byte byte patterns. Um, that's actually a pretty strong indication that they're using a um, non-chaining 8-byte block cipher that will produce the same cipher text for a given 8-byte plain text, and it will repeat that cipher text if you encrypt repeated copy of the plain text. And for this Triforce thing, I don't want to go into the details so much, but we know that the games are encrypted using DES. So the idea is, while well, they have a DES hardware, maybe the firmware is encrypted using DES as well. So this was kind of the starting point. I wanted to get this firmware because I'm interested in it. Um, there's no real gain, but I mean, it's a mystery, and I want to solve that mystery. So if we look at the firmware file, do a histogram of eight byte blocks and sort them, uh, we see that there are some duplicate blocks, but there are two distinct ciphertexts that are repeated a lot more often than the other ones. And so the assumption here is that either of these plain texts encrypt to all zero or all FF, because that's a pretty popular pattern in a random binary that's executed. So, yeah, the assumption is that any of those two will decrypt to all zero. Um, let's call them C1 and C2. We don't know which one is what. Uh, we only know that they both occur magnitude more often than any other ciphertext in the binary. Um, there's one particular thing here. The Triforce games are actually DS encrypted, as said, but they are also byte reversed before and after the encryption. So uh, we have to keep this in mind. If we are looking, if we are brute forcing for a key, we want to be sure that we are looking for the correct um, ciphertext, because otherwise we might miss it because it's byte swapped. Um, so we want to take into account that they might be reversed as well. So. Um, Another interesting thing about DES is the complementation property. It means that if you invert the plain text and you invert the key, you get an inverted cipher text. Um, this doesn't sound so interesting, but for brute forcing, it's actually very interesting because um, if we have the cipher text of an all FF and we invert that cipher text and we, find, we can find a key that encrypts all zero into this inverted cipher text, um, the key will be actually the invert of the real key. So it's yeah, written down here. Um, this basically means that we can cut the time to brute force in, to half the time because it saves us one bit. We are equally likely to find the inverted key and the non-inverted key. So we can find either of them and then we just invert it if it's the wrong one. So it's inter yeah, it's something to keep in mind. So to formulate our goal for breaking this mystery, uh, we have two plain text. 
they might be reversed, so we will also look for an uh, inverted version or re byte reversed version of this. Awesome, thanks. Um, and we will, for both plain text, uh, for both ciphertext, obviously, we will also look for the inverted version because of this death property. And we, we, our assumption was that it is an all zero um, plain text. So what we will do is to encrypt zero with all possible keys until we find any of these eight, eight byte, uh, any of these eight eight byte patterns. And if we found any key that encrypts zeros into any of these values, we are pretty likely that we have found the key. So that's our goal. Um, yeah, DES, I, probably everybody knows this, but it's a block cipher based on the Feistel scheme, so it does this, it has 16 rounds, so it always uses half of the previous round output and puts, uh, uses a round function on it and then exhausts it with the remaining half from the last round. Um, it's 16 rounds. This is how a round looks like. Um, the only real work here is, are the S boxes. There are eight S boxes with a six bit, bit input, four bit output. And these are really, this is really the element of DES that requires the most work, regardless if you do this in software or in hardware. Um, S boxes, yeah, you, if you're implementing DES on a CPU, you could use a lookup table for the S boxes. But there's a much more efficient way, which is called bit slicing. It basically means that you're breaking up your S boxes from being, it's not anymore a lookup table, but you break it up into logical um, operations. And you, the, the nice thing about logical operations is you can run them on 128 bits in parallel if you have a vector unit, which most CPUs have. So the way to go for ALU-based architectures, so that includes CPUs, that includes GPUs, that includes SPUs um, on the cell, um, is to, to do bit slicing. And it's on a traditional Intel CPU, like on a real high-end machine, um, you get about 64 million keys per second you can tr that you can try. Or on a six core machine, six times that value, which is 384 million keys per second on a real high-end machi machine. So this is not a random machine that's standing somewhere that you want to recycle. This is a high-end machine that you would buy today. Um, so this is our key space, 56 bits. And 384 million keys per second means that in one second we can walk 28.5 bits. Um, this is, okay, so um, of course this is logarithmic, so it doesn't mean in one second we have half the key space. It means that, well, we still need the remaining um, 27.5, 2 to the power of 27.5 times this second. So um, a day has two to the power of 16.4 seconds. Um, it's interesting to say it this way because you can just add them up. So you know that you will get 44.9 bits done a day. Um, and if we f just leave it running until we reach the end of the key space, it requires us six years to walk the entire key space. And that's on a high-end machine today with a 100% duty cycle running 24-7. So, Six years, I don't know, I'm interested in that key now, and I want it in a week and not in six years. So just leaving it running for a week, there's still some, we won't walk the entire key space in a week, obviously. But we can just use more machines. So we can use 313 machines, approximately. And then we will get our key in a week, which is still not what I want to do. Um, yeah, so the cell, everybody knows about the cell and the PlayStation and so on. So um, the cell SPU can evaluate 128 S-Box lookups in 40 instructions using this bit slicing technology. Um, it's equivalent to 64 cycles per key or 50 million keys per second at 3.2 gigahertz, um, which is about 300 million keys per second per PS3 or... Um, actually 350, thanks to Marken. Um, so it's about as fast as a high-end machine. So it's still not gaining us so much. We could buy 300 PlayStations or 300 PCs. And I'm not sure what the better deal. Okay, GPUs. People are telling me GPUs are fast. They have like m many cores working in parallel. Um, there's a problem. Everybody's using GPUs for MD5 and SHA-1. But these are actually, MD5 and SHA-1 are actually optimized to run on ALU-based systems, like on a CPU. 
DES is optimized to run in hardware because when it was designed, there was only hardware to run it in. So um, DES is not really suited well for GPUs. You could do the bit slicing thing again. Um, we can estimate it to like it's about 10 times as fast as on a single CPU core, like on this high-end CPU core. It would be 640 million keys per second, or 29 or 2 bits. It still, it still takes a while. So if we put it up here, for the PC, it would cost 313 devices, $150,000 about, if we calculate $500 per node. For the PS3, it's a little bit better. It, it's only 93 uh, thousand dollar but you still need a hack because Sony removed that other OS feature and you would have to pay a hacker to do the hack and you would have to pay a lawyer to if Sony comes back and we don't want that so um, the GPU approach is much nicer already because it's we can yeah we can use one PC and stick in a number of high-end cards and we can estimate it to be like forty five thousand dollar but it's still too much that's not what I want to pay for solving this mystery Obviously, there's one item missing, which is FPGAs, which is this talk about. So let's see what FPGAs can do. On an FPGA, um, first, you basically have the choice um, to implement a pipeline design, which means that you unroll the DES um, into the 16 DES rounds, so they will both all exist in parallel on the chip, and um, the, that gives you one encryption per cycle after an initial latency. Um, but it's also 16 times as big as using a space-optimized design, which only implements one instance of the round function and uses the 16 times. Um, it evens out, but actually on an FPGA, a non-pipeline design is less efficient because there's some logic around the round function that you, um, you would have to replicate more often. So actually uh, going for the unrolled design is a much, much better choice here. Um, if we can fit about 1 to 10 pipeline DES designs in a single FPGA, depending on the FPGA size, um, depending on the FPGA, we can run them from 100 to 200 megahertz, which doesn't sound so crazy, but we, we will get one key per cycle, which is much better than what a CPU or a GPU or a SPU is able to do. So that gives us in the order of 100 to 2,000 million keys per second already. Um, so for one week, I still need 60 of the big FPGAs or 1,200 of the tiny ones. Um, so here's our key space again. Um, here, if we take a high-end PC, we get that, that many keys per second. Then we, if we scale this up for a year, we, we're still not done with the key space. So what DistributedNet was doing back then when they cracked DES was they took a, they, they had a distributed client you can run on your machine, um, and the, the largest or the, the peak connection or peak contributor count, I should say, was about 25,800 users that are, uh, cake, that are working on a DES project at the same time. Obviously, those were not using PCs as we have today, like this high-end PC didn't exist back then. Um, so if you would have 25,000 of these high-end PCs, it wouldn't even take a day to break this. It would take much less. Um, but that's not an option because you won't, be, you won't get 25,000 gamers to work on your project and not play games anymore. So that's not an option, unfortunately. Um, using an FPGA gives us a slight improvement in the rate, but that's not so much the main point. Um, so if we, again, target for the week, it will still not work. It will not work with 16 FPGAs, but it will work with 256 FPGAs. So it's much better already than the high-end PC. So people built that. It's called, um, it's looking like this, or this was actually a prototype of it. It's called Copa Cobana, the cost-optimized parallel code breaker. <laughs> I think it's a pretty cool name, actually. And, so um, it wasn't my idea, of course. So this was a project that a uh, university designed in 2006. Um, they, their hardware required 12.8 days to walk the entire key space. They used 120 um, Spartan 3 FPGAs. It turned out that at last back then, but it's probably still true today, the Spartan 3 at this size is about the, the best logic per price um, you could get. So. It's only $4,200 in FPGAs if you do it that way. 
if you look at the list price, you might get them cheaper, or if you talk to Zidings, you might even get them more cheaper, but um, it's still cool, but I still don't want to pay $4,200 for the keys. Much better than what we had before, but it's still too much. Um, so my goal was to not spend more than $1,000 on it. And um, yeah, I looked around and tried to use, to use FPGAs from different vendors or different FPGAs, and it, it didn't work out. The cheapest thing was about, the, about as expensive as this Copacabana thing. So using new parts, it just didn't work. So that's when I came up with eBay. Um, if you search for FPGA and for chip recovery, you will find some weird stuff. You will find boards that have been pulled out of, let's say, 3G base stations or network equipment or whatever, video processing, and there's usually no documentation on them or there are pro usually not even decent pictures. Probably they just say what chips are on there and they have no clue what this is about. You can be happy if they don't destroy the board because what they believe that what people want to do is to desolder the BGA chip, reball it, and then use it again. Which kind of makes sense when an FPGA costs about $2,000, but this, this, these chips are usually a few years old, and I wouldn't want to build a, some, some, some project that requires a $2,000 FPGA based on used hardware if I have to deploy it. So, I'm not quite sure what they want to do, but anyway, if you do this, you will find very interesting stuff. It's kind of hit or miss what you get, right? Because you don't know what you're buying. Um, so what I bought was this. Uh, this was the picture I got, or about the picture. It says exactly nothing, except that this is a PCB with a Xilinx Vertex 2 Pro on it. So the, the, the item description was three Xilinx Vertex 2 Pro um, on PC board. Yeah. That's true, but it doesn't say much. Anyway, I bought them, they were cheap. Um, the Vertex 2 Pro in question, if we look up the list price today, I mean, this, this FPGA is from 2006 about, or 2005. Um, if we look up the list price today, um, it is whopping $2,000 per piece still, if you buy them new. Um, and we just paid $50 for three of them, which is a much better deal. Um, <laughs> Obviously, they are end of life, so the list price doesn't really reflect the, the value of that chip, but, but it's still not a bad deal. So, um, if you compare this with modern FPGAs, you won't get that logic capacity of that chip anyway near $50. That's just impossible. You would still pay, maybe not $2,000, but maybe $1,000. Um, the good thing is, the, they, I bought three boards of those, and the remaining about 50, or we are not quite sure how many they actually are because of some logistic problems, of these boards have been obtained and they are in good hands, and the plan is to bring them up and make people use them for projects, which is not so easy because you cannot just compile stuff for it, um, but that's what I, why I'm holding this talk, to make it easier. So the plan is to bring them up and use them for interesting projects. Um, if you have an unknown board, say you bought one of these boards from eBay and you want to use them, the first thing we need to do is to find power. We need to power up the board. And if you're lucky, it's just a single voltage. If you're not so lucky, it's mul it has multiple voltages or even the um, power sequence requirements. So let's hope it just requires a single voltage and has the, regula the regulators on board. Um, the next thing we need to talk to the FPGA, so we need to find JTAG. Um, which is this um, standard to, or which is the way how you talk to FPGAs? It's like uh, four dedicated pins, and you can program the FPGA. We'll come to that later. Um, if you have JTAG, you can program a bitstream into the FPGA. You still, but you still need to do something. So what you need is a clock, and of course these bots usually have clocks. I mean, they, they are hopefully still working. So, um, but you have to find them. The, the right um, pin on the FPGA. So power, so this is the board, by the way, uh, that I got. It's some 10 gigabit ethernet uh, network something. I have no clue what is, this really is, but it has a 10 gigabit ethernet switch on it, the Broadcom chip on the left, and it had an optical transceiver on the right, which is missing. Um, and in the middle, you can see the three big fat FPGAs. Um, so to power this up, um, this is the power connector. Um, there are two of them, actually, but they are wired in parallel. 
So finding ground is easy. You just find another ground and yeah, use a continuity checker. Um, then the next two pins, or one of them, is probably the high power input voltage. Getting the right voltage is not so easy. So what you should do is to check the regulator setup, check how the power supply on the board is working, check the data sheets of the chips for the maximum ratings, check capacitors for the maximum rating, so you at last know an, a maximum value that you should never exceed. Getting the real value, I mean, they could use like 25 volt rated capacitors and still only require 5 volts. Um, try it try applying 5 volts, and if nothing happens, and if it doesn't draw any power, crank it up. Um, be careful, you don't want to destroy a board, but you, pr you probably don't have to destroy a board. It's pr usually possible to figure this out without destroying a board. I mean, we have enough of these boards, so it wouldn't be so much a problem, but it would still be a pity. So um, We found out that it requires 12 volts, which is great, because 12 volts, there are already made power supplies for 12 volts, so... That's great. There was a third pin here. If you looked into the power connector, I don't have a photo here, but it's a little bit shorter. And that indicates that this is meant for a hot plug operation, when you plug this board into a back plane, so that one of the pins get power the last. So it turns out this is actually a 12 volt sense pin or a power good pin. So if you just wire them up in parallel to the 12 volts, um, you'll be fine. So once you do that, it will at last um, it will at last, um, an LED will go on, which is some sign of life, and the power, the power current, or the current is in a reasonable range, so everything seems fine. Of course, the board is not doing anything. Um, okay, so we found power, and the next thing is to find JTAG. Mm, you can be lucky and you can be unlucky. In this case, so first JTAG, we are looking here for uh, four pins. TDO is an output from the FPGA to the JTAG header, most, since people developing for FPGAs need JTAG for programming the FPGA and debugging, usually all of these boards still have a decent JTAG header. Um, the pinout might be different each time, but the, the chances are pretty, pretty big that there's still a JTAG header on the thing. So TDO is an output from the FPGA. TDI, TCK, TMS are inputs into the FPGA. Um, the FPGAs can actually be chained together so that TDO of one FPGA will go into the TDI of the next FPGA, and then you have them all in a chain, which is convenient. Uh, anyway, we're looking for these signals and, of course, ground. So we are looking for a header that has these four signals and ground. Um, this is the backside of the FPGA on these boards. So um, it's really nice, and it's pretty uncommon, actually. They have a via for each of the ball of the FPGA. So it's a um, 1,152 ball package, so, but they have a via for all of the balls, so you can access all of them, which is great. And what's even, even better is that they marked the, um, they numbered the, the vias on the edge. Um, so it can, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see that it, it has the numbers of the um, columns and it also has the rows. So that's very convenient on this spot. So you can access any pin. So what we just do, we look up in the data sheet where the TCK, TDI, TDO, TMS pins are. Um, we locate the via, um, doing cr cross checking simply, so it's simple. But um, then we have to trace the via. And this is, a, I think, an eight layer board or something, or even a 12 layer board. It's pretty thick. Um, so it's pretty hard to trace a signal. Um, the, the trick here is to use tinfoil. You use a continuity checker, you connect one end to the pin you want to find, you connect the other end to tinfoil, and then you just push the, pin, the tinfoil on the board. And if it beeps, you know that somewhere in this area... Of course, people will tell you to never do this because um, continuity checker applies voltage to that and ESD and everything. Um, the truth is, I never destroyed a board using that. You might be unlucky, so... <laughs> but still, um, it's, I think, the way to go. Um, you can then, if you know the approximate range, you could yeah, make your tinfoil a bit smaller to, to reduce the area and finally try each um, signal you can find. Um, so, yeah. And we did this, so here's TCK, you can find the, the, the via pretty easily. Um, we found this header, the picture's actually broken, one of them is TMS, 
Anyway, um, so we found a six pin header with ground, the JTAG signals, and a voltage sense. Um, be careful because FPGAs usually run at a low voltage, or at least the core runs at a low voltage, and it might be less than 3.3 .3 volts. So if you um, use JTAG, be careful to use the correct levels. Um, in this case, it's 2.5 volt. Um, so that's why the voltage sense is there. So it, the better JTAG adapters use this pin to control their output voltage. OK, so we found JTAG. We still need to find clocks. JTAG also allows you to do some, a thing called boundary scan, which basically means you can query this, the digital value of each pin. Um, there are some tools. This is a random tool, but there are more tools. You can even write this yourself. It's pretty simple, actually. Um, that display the, the state of the whole chip in real time. So if a pin toggles, you will see this, that it will go from red to green or the other way around. And it will also display you what pins changed. So if you find a pin that changed all the time, it's pretty likely a clock pin. You can use a scope to ver verify that. Um, so that's one way to find clock pins. The other way is FPGAs usually have dedicated clock pins that, are, that have better routing across the whole chip. So they're global clock pins, GCK, Fox Islington, but all other FPGAs have them as well. Um, so just look up the data sheet, look for uh, the dedicated clock inputs. There are eight, I think, on this FPGA, and just scope them or write something on the FPGA that blinks an LED or something um, uh, clocked from this clock. So um, finding the clock pins is usually not so much the problem. And I found a nice 155 megahertz clock, so that's great to go. So we have the clocks. Let's see what we can do. So if you do the math, you need about 20 boards of these to get it in one week. So 20 times 50 is about 1K, which is coincidentally exactly the value I wanted to spend on this project, um, which is already a great start. Um, so if we add the, the table, the FPGA to the table, we will see that for 1K, we can get the equivalent power of, well, what was too expensive before based on recycled FPGA hardware. Um, OK, so for the uh, implementation, um, remember, I still want to find the zeros that encrypt to any of the 8-byte blocks. So what I w w um, was doing is to, build, to take multiple DES cores in one FPGA that all encrypt the same, all zero plain text. It's actually selectable, but it's all zero for this. And match it against multiple patterns, because if we have, want to find multiple keys that all have the same plain text, we can do this in run, one run to the key space. We don't have to run the key space twice. So put them all into the table and match for multiple patterns. That's much easier than running the key space, working the key space once for each of the patterns. Um, the, the way I've implemented this is that each curve searches a key space segment. Uh, the lower, lower bits will be identical for all um, DES cores by a single counter in the FPGA, and the upper bits are the work unit. So here we see we have the zeros, we have the key. Um, we see that the right part of the key is identical for each of the DES cores. Um, this is a 40-bit count in this case, so I broke it up after 16 bits, for example. Um, and the work unit is the, the upper 16-bit of the key. Um, so each DS code searches a separate segment, and that's why each DS code produces different ciphertext. Uh, we then have to match these ciphertext against all the patterns we have. And um, so and we actually see in this prepared example that there's a match, which is pretty uncommon, of course, because most of the time it won't match any of those. So if it finds a match, it will stop the FPGA and wait for the host to collect the result. To get a sense of the numbers, if we have eight cores at 200 megahertz and with 16 patterns, we're generating 12.8 gigabytes per second encrypted data per FPGA. And we will match that 12.8 gigabytes against 16 ciphertext in parallel, which means that we have 204 gigabytes per second that we need to compare, which is pretty massive. Um, and also explains why PC has so much trouble in getting decent rates at DS cracking. The naive approach for the matcher that matches up the DES results against the patterns is to have eight byte registers implemented in FPGA logic, have eight times 16 compare units. This is all for 16 patterns because I had some more keys I wanted to put for some test keys to make sure that it's working. 
Um, if you implement it this way, it will already take about one fourth of the whole FPGA just for the matcher. A better approach is to use the thing called content addressable memory. It's like normal memory, except you don't supply an address and get the data, but you supply data and get an address or actually a match mask. Um, for Xilinx, you can use BRAMs to implement this, but it's not real content addressable memory, it's more a bit mask. So you have for example, if you want to match 8-bit words, uh, so one byte of the pattern, you have 256 entries with 64 bits each, and then you have, if you want to look for 64 um, results. Um, so it, it looks like a waste at the first sight, because real content addressable memory only had like um, the number of patterns entries, but that's not how it works on Xilinx. It looks like waste, but the great thing is, once we have the bit mask, we can ma do mask searching. We can mask, mask out bits during the search, or we can search for results that result in ASCII or in numbers or anything. Um, and we get that basically for free. BRAMs also, BRAMs are block RAMs, so it's dedicated resources in the FPGA that are real memory. You can implement memory in the logic, but it's pretty expensive, so that's why they added BRAMs, which is a separate memory that can be used by the logic. And there are many of these units, usually more than you need, and or at last in this project more than I, I need it. So they are basically free. They, they are there anyway, and we can just use them, and it frees up a lot of resources already by using them for the matching. Okay, the next part is communication with the FPGA. We, we don't want to reverse engineer the, for example, in this board, the 10 gigabit ethernet switch or something, because it's pretty complicated to use. We don't need a high speed communication when doing brute forcing, but because all we're doing is to upload some, some um, patterns and upload the key space identifiers. And um, yeah, so we should rather focus on reusability and um, cross platform that you could use any host to talk with the thing and don't need cr crazy hardware and simplicity. Simplicity. So there's a nice thing, Xilinx and other FPGA vendors as well offer a thing to build some logic in the FPGA that will be part of the JTEX chain. It's called user JTEX chain on Xilinx. And since you need JTEX anyway for programming the FPGAs, you basically get a low speed communication link for free. So that's why we're using JTEX for the communication with our core, um, because it's just there. We don't need to reverse more pins. We can just use it. There's an open source tool, XC3S proc, um, that supports many different cables and a lot of Xilinx devices. Um, what I did was to build a Python wrapper around it to provide two simple features, which is program a bitstream and scan something through this user chain, which is this communication mechanism. So uh, I could write my code in Python, which is much easier for me. Um, so the idea is there's a host. The host will program the FPGAs, upload the bitstream configure the matcher, up, which means uploading the patterns, and set the, the key prefixes for each DES unit, and then start the matcher counting up, and the DES engines will um, encrypt zeros with the, the key prefix they got plus the counter. Um, if the matcher detects a hit, it will stop counting up, it will set a status bit. The host will at some point pull the status like once a second or even often. Even, um, more. So, and if a match is found, it will just restart um, at the next key. Um, we need so for the distributed um, approach, we need a server to keep track of the work units because um, I, I want to use several different FPGA boards, all brute forcing my key, and I don't want to, them all to be connected to a single machine. So I have, uh, we need a server to, to keep track of work units. We need a client that requests work units. It's a pretty simple protocol. Um, it will, this client will get the work unit ID, configure an FPGA to search that key space segment, and deliver the result, which is usually no key found, but sometimes it's a better result. Um, there's some framework that just implemented this, like this Boeing framework used for City at Home and some other projects. Um, the problem is they're pretty complicated. They're pretty optimized for doing stuff on a PC, on CPUs. They are, Boeing, for example, is not so much optimized for doing brute force attacks. It's more optimized for having a lot of data to process. So it wasn't quite the right choice, so um, I just implemented a very simple framework. Um, Okay, so let's do a live demo of this. Um, and we just wait a week and then we have the key. 
um, that's not so much a good idea, so let's just skip some bits. Um, we, instead of matching for the full um, 64 bits of the cipher text, uh, of, the, yeah, of the cipher text, we will just match a, a few less bits. So we, basically, the, what we will be doing is this. We have zeros, we encrypt them with a the key that we are looking for, and the result should be this hex string, um, except that we don't care for the last three bytes, because we don't want to wait, wait a week. Um, there's roughly one hit per 40 bits of key space, which means it's, yeah, um, one sixty-four thousandth of a real search. Um, it will still take about one hour on a high-end machine. So let's do it here. Um, I can, so I prototype, or I could prototype this on a um, hundred fifty dollars starter kit, FPGA kit, or in any FPGA kit actually. Um, and run it, it would run, but it would still take a few hours. Um, so let's add some more FPGAs and run this thing. And now I need some extra time to set this up, so um, yeah, just excuse me for one minute and then I have it working. Maybe someone can tell a joke or something, or do a lightning talk, or I don't know. Um, yeah, that's the problem, right? I just need to re-enable my stuff since we moved it and rebooted, and it doesn't boot automatically, so excuse this. Um. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Yeah, but not that part. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's fine. <coughs> okay, it's all looking good. Except for the dream box. Um, what do we need to plug in? Uh, yeah, yeah, is it long enough? Probably not. Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay, I will. S um, yeah. Okay. Um. Is that a reasonable size? Does this still works, right? Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, I will first initialize the server project again. Um, I prepared this, I can show you what it actually does. It's um, setting up a new um, desk crack project. It says it configures the DS project using, it says that work unit is 34 bits, so this is about two minutes. So we get a result after a work unit completed, and I don't want to wait so long, so I scaled it down to 34 bits, which means that every 2 to the power of 34 bits uh, keys, we will get a response from the thing. Um, I limited the key space search for 48 bits, which is still plenty enough to find something. I added a highly secure password, and I added the pattern, um, which, is, which we are looking for. The, the lower bits I don't care, so uh, we will look for anything that encrypts and zeros that encrypt to this pattern, except for the last three bytes. Um, and now we can, the server's running in the background, I hope. Um, okay, so we can run the bot. So what it, this is now the, the client that talks to this thing, to three of the bots from eBay. Um, this is, you can see it programs the bitstream into the FPGAs. There are nine FPGAs in this setup, so it will take about 
seven seconds per FPGA to program the bit stream, and we have to wait for that. Um, will be done soon. Um, yeah. So it's actually interesting to see um, the, the power consumption of F FPGAs when doing crypto operations, because usually if you calculate the power of an FPGA doing work, you assume that about 10% of your flip-flops will change during, in each cycle, which is a reasonable number for a CPU curve or anything normal, like data processing. For crypto operations, we assume that half of our flip-flops um, will toggle each cycle. Okay, um, and that means that the power estimations are five times as much as you would have them if you would run some general purpose stuff at a given clock frequency, which means we actually have to add some cooling to the FPGAs. Um, you can see they are running at 156 megahertz now. Um, let me make this a little bit smaller so it fits on the screen. Still not. Uh, there we go. Um, so every third of the FPGA is running at a different clock rate simply because that's how they are wired up and I, I didn't change that. Um, so they produce quite an amount of heat and draw quite an amount of power already at this rate. Um, each board takes about 3.5 to 4 amps of 12 volts. Um, so in total, this is about 80 watts or something, um, which is pretty something where you need active cooling already. It's, you cannot compare this to running general stuff at this clock rate. Okay, anyway, it will search the key space now and it will deliver the results to my server and we will just keep it running for, for some time and um, come back later. Um, the, the, plat the framework I was developing is called Crunchy, um, because it crunches numbers. Uh, you can find it here on GitHub soon, I have to say. Um, what you find there is basically something that lets you build a brute force core for your Spartan 3A starter kit and test it and brute force some keys. And then with a single command line, you can build a bit stream that works on this machine and you don't even need to have access to this machine. And you can give me the bitstream and I can work on your project. That's the whole idea. So if we have this 50 units of these boards, we can set them up somewhere. People can develop for them at home without having to care about the cooling of 50 of these boards. And then um, they can build a bitstream for the much larger unit and because it scales up linear. So that's the nice thing about brute forcing. It's, it scales incredibly simple. Um, the way this is done, there's some, so this crunchy framework is pretty, pretty small actually. It provides some wrappers around your logic to, that make sure that you can run your, the same HDL or the same course on your starter kit or on some random FPGA as you could run on the huge device. So there's a definition of a board, which is basically the yeah, for example, the Spartan 3A starter kit or this, um, this thing or some other boards. So you have a definition of a board that, I will just explain what that includes. We have a definition of a project, for example, a DES crack, um, that contains the actual HDL to build the bitstream, like the DES core, the matcher, some metadata. Um, there's some piece of thing that runs on the server that configures the work units, for example, the number of work units we have and how to make sure that they, how to validate them and so on. Um, and something for the client, which actually communicates with the course that it just built. Um, and then there are parameters that configure a project to run on a board. For example, the number of cores is something you, you have to change. If on a small FPGA, you want to have one core. On a big FPGA, you want to have six cores or ten cores. And you want to reconfigure that. So. Um, the board support provides top-level HDL that, for example, talks with the LEDs or something. It's really not much. It's in total 100 lines of code. You can add a support for a specific board if you have the pinout in half an hour, maybe. And the board 
um, defines interfaces that projects can use, like very simple interfaces like clock, which is a single line where clock is coming, or LEDs, where, which is a single line where you want to display status. So you can see it blinking, maybe. No, it's, you can later see it blinking. And actually, it doesn't. Yeah, it, it blinks. So um, you can see it blinking. And there's like this user JTAG thing. So yeah, as I said, it's a really tiny piece of code that will allow you to run any project call that somebody else developed on your board. So yeah, if we see this here, there's a S3A starter. Um, and it has a slot for a project that offers the reset interface, which is the reset line, a clock interface, and the user JTAG interface. So three <laughs> simple interfaces here. Um, and any project that uses these interfaces can just plug into this slot. Um, the project provides HDL that can, can be configured depending on the needs. For example, the number of cores is configurable. Um, the, the, it, the project also provides client code that uses the abstracted board interface, which is um, the scan user thing, to talk to the FPGA. So if you, ha if you want to use, I use a simple FTDI based JTAG cable, but if you use, want to use a proprietary JTAG interface, you could just rewrite the, the abstracted board, or the, 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 the actual um, interface of the board to provide the same, the same interface, and then other projects can use that code. And there's some server code, as I said, to configure the parameters. This is how the, the actual project here looks like. We have, a, for number of course, equals four, for example. We have four desk cores. They all talk, deliver the result to the matcher. The matcher controls the, um, the, the counter, the lower bits of the key. And they, all, they are all chained up in this user JTAG change, so we can talk to them. Um, if you have a board, or if you if you choose a board, a project, and the parameters to fit the project into the board, you can build a bitstream. And a bitstream is what you load on the FPGA. Um, the server project, uh, the server contains a definition of, of the project it's running, and it lists um, supported boards with their parameters, and it just reads bitstreams. So you don't have to build the bitstream on your own. You can just attach to a server, and if the server has a definition for your board, um, you can use that bitstream that was already pre-built. Uh, you can also supply your own ones if you have a custom FPGA board. And um, yeah, the, the, the code, the client code that runs, that talks to the FPGAs, knows how to talk to your board then. Um, so the idea is really you prototype your boot processor on a small FPGA and you run it on a big cluster which is nice if you have access to a big cluster. The alternative is to just run it on a lot of devices. So some consumer hardware have FPGAs, like for example the 3G femtocells. If you look at them, they have a pretty large FPGA on them. Another example is this, uh, this satellite receiver. Um, I was working on this project a while ago, that's why I'm using it. It's a great receiver, by the way, but that's not why I have it here. The, the reason why I have it here is because it has an FPGA that's used normally for um, muxing data streams between the tuners to the, to the SOC decoder. It's a Spartan 3E500, so it's not so huge, but it's still useful if you have a lot of them. JTAG is available as a GPIO, so what we can do is to run the same project that we run on the big device on a Dreambox. And we can build something that Dreambox users can install to use their FPGA processing time, um, for example, in standby mode, similar to what distributed net was doing. Just we do it for FPGAs. And it is much more effective to do this on FPGAs, also power-wise. Um, so this can be an interesting thing if there are a large number of devices out there that you could get. Um, so I was supposed to do a demo here. I will do the demo later because I don't, it might take some time to get this set up again. Um, possible improvements for this project. You can work on the DES course, of course. The Copa Cubana project has the, their course optimized for um, this, for the, their architecture. Um, I just used the open course DES core. We have some, some work in progress here. Um, you can add, of course, other number crunching projects. 
we could add more communication methods if JTAG is not available or it's support for non sidings devices, all of that. On the client server side, I said it's pretty simple currently. What I would like to see is that you can subscribe to a project feed and say, hey, I want to work on any project that some person finds interesting, some person I trust finds interesting, and then it will automatically take part in an interesting project that that person announced. Something like that. So you don't have to reconfigure your device every time a project finished. So you just, yeah, it will just pull if there's work to do and do the work. Also, I haven't implemented any kind of security um, except for my top secret password. Um, especially there's no anti-cheating security, so you can just grab 100,000 work units and supply them as work done and nobody will notice. There are some interesting methods to, to, to validate responses and that needs to be implemented if you're using this framework outside of um, a trusted environment. Um, same goes into the other direction, bitstream authentication. You don't want to run a random bitstream on your FPGA bot um, because the bitstream could do very bad things. So you want to have some authentication here. But yeah. Oh, results, right. So we had this running. And let's see if it found something. So remember, um, on a PC, we would expect it to find one key per hour about. So let's see what it got here. So we can ask for the status. And then, oh, it found already a number of keys that all match the given um, ciphertext. So let's try one of them. Uh, let's try just encrypting zeros with any of these keys and look for what the result's looking like. And if everything worked, which I hope so, then it should give the pattern that we have been looking for. So um, I will just use whatever, the first one, um, and um, encrypt, typing is difficult, encrypting eight zeros with it, and I want to show this hex string, and we see we got our pattern here. We got 32, 37, 43, 33, which is 2733, um, and the zero, and um, the last three bytes are filled with random data. So if we take another key that it found, this one, we will see that the last bytes differ, of course. I hope you can read this. Um, I can make it larger. It's too much. Um, yeah, so you can see that it actually worked. It just found, while we, I was doing the talk here, it found some keys that match our pattern. And um, of course, this is just a 40-bit key search, but it's still pretty impressive how many keys, we, how many hits we got. Um, we, we can see how many work units is already finished. So a work unit was two to the power of 34 bits. And we can see that it already finished 306 work units. Um, which is 108% of our reduced key space um, in just a few minutes here. So, yeah. Okay, this was obviously a demo result, but it was calculated live on this device, so there was no cheating involved. Um, if you don't believe me, you can give me another text to look for, and I will brute force your partial key. Um, but this is a boring result because, well, it's a magic number maybe, but it's, it doesn't help us solving our mystery. So while I was implementing this, I let it run for a few, um, for a few days, basically, running my test code. And uh, some days I was looking at the result, and I found this. I found actually a key that was not one of my test keys. And if you look at this, this is a pretty simple key, right? It's 002244. Um, so if you look at it in binary, it starts with um, actually um, 11 zeros. No, 10 zeros, whatever. Many zeros. So that, since I started the key search at zero upwards, I found it pretty early. So I found it on the 276th work unit, which is in a, after about five hours or something. So again, if, so here's the problem. If this is a 56-bit key space and you choose a bad key, and you, keys should be random, always random, don't try to set the first 10 bits, or I will crack it as well by just starting at the... Um, upper. So choose random keys. If you don't do that, you will lose important bits of the key space. And in this case, I have again my standard FPGA set up, nine units, and um, it just required me 109 hours, if I do the math, to, to get the key, because the key is so bad. 
So it actually brute forced the, the real unknown key already. Pretty simple key, but I wouldn't have guessed. So if we look, if we decrypt our patterns, we should see some match here. So we see that if we decrypt the, um, th these are the eight patterns again that I've talked before. So the, the, the marked here are the byte reverse C1 and the byte reverse C2. So we actually see that they decrypt to all zeros and all FF. So we found the key. We found the non-negated key, by the way. Um, so the best complementation thing didn't really help, but we found the key. And it was C1 was all zero, it was byte reversed, lucky that we looked for that. So if we decrypt the firmware now, we can see some strings. This is actually part of the security protocol that the device talks with the game authentication dongle. Um, so I could finally, after like literally two years, I could solve this mystery by brute forcing a DES key. So. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So if anyone else has keys to brute force, I mean, if they are DES, feel free to give me the, the ciphertext and, um, yeah, the, the pass. Um, if you have any questions, I will be down in the hack center the next two days, or two and a half days. Um, if you, yeah, want to build support for your FPGA board, ask me, it's not, it's really not a big deal. And yeah, keep on hacking. Thank you, Felix, for the great talk. So my talk is about distributed FPGA number crunching for the masses. What a title. Um, so let's start with the number crunching part of it. So it's a valid question to ask who is still doing number crunching these days. I mean, breaking keys is nice, but hasn't everybody moved to 128-bit encryption now, AES and so on? Yeah, most stuff has moved, but it turns out there's plenty of stuff that's still unsolved that has been encrypted with um, like DES and where we still don't know the key. And it's, there are some interesting things to work on that still require number crunching action. So um, DES, of course, as I said, is a classic example of brute forcing keys. People have done that. Um, it's a 56-bit key space, so it's manageable. Um, there are some synthetic problems, like the, the N-Queens problem. People are trying to solve this using FPGAs. Um, the distributed net OGR project and a couple of other things, but for talk, um, let's focus on a real-world example. So this device is a Triforce arcade machine. It's something that's hidden in an arcade cabinet in the end, so this is where the actual game is working on. It's a modified GameCube. It doesn't matter so much. So inside this thing, um, there's also a dedicated processor that's, happy, that's doing security stuff and some management stuff and so on. And a certain version of these Triforces have a thing called, um, oh yeah, so yeah, so the games have been dumped and emulated. You can run them in an emulator today, similar to MAME. It's a different emulator, but it works. But there's still one unsolved mystery. And um, if we look closer, one of the files that run on this machine is a file called firmware.asic. And it's obviously encrypted if you look at it. And so far, nobody really knows what this file is supposed to do. We know it's some kind of a firmware, and we know if you invert the key, you get an inverted ciphertext. Um, this doesn't sound so interesting, but for brute forcing, it's actually very interesting, because um, if we have the ciphertext of an all FF, and we invert that ciphertext, and we, find, we can find a key that encrypts all zero into this inverted ciphertext, um, the key will be actually the invert of the real key. So it's yeah, written down here. Um, this basically means that we can cut the time to brute force in, to half the time because it saves us one bit. We are equally likely to find the inverted key and the non-inverted key. So we can find either of them and then we just invert it if it's the wrong one. So it's, yeah, it's something to keep in mind. So 
to formulate our goal for breaking this mystery. And we have two plain text. They might be reversed, so we will also look for an inverted version or re byte reversed version of this. Awesome, thanks. Um, and we will, for both plain text, uh, for both ciphertext, obviously, we will also look for the inverted version because of this death property. And we, we, our assumption was that it is an all zero um, plain text. So what we will do is to encrypt zero with all possible keys until we find any of these eight, eight byte, uh, any of these eight eight byte patterns. And if we found any key that encrypts zeros into any of these values, we are pretty likely that we have found the key. So that's our goal. Um, yeah, DES, probably everybody knows this, but it's a block cipher based on the Feistel scheme, so it does this. It has 16 rounds, so it always uses half of the previous round output and puts, um, uses a round function on it and then exhausts it with the remaining half from the last round. Um, it's 16 rounds. This is how a round looks like. Um, the only real work here is, are the S boxes. There are eight S boxes with a six bit, bit input, four bit output. And these are really, this is really the element of DES that requires the most work, regardless if you do this in software or in hardware. Um, S boxes, yeah, you, if you're implementing DES on a CPU, you could use a lookup table for the S boxes. But there's a much more efficient way, which is called bit slicing. It basically means that you're breaking up your S-boxes from being... It's not anymore a lookup table, but you break it up into logical um, operations. And you, the, the nice thing about logical operations is you can run them on 128 bits in parallel if you have a vector unit, which most CPUs have. So the way to go for ALU-based architectures, so that includes CPUs, that includes GPUs, that includes SPUs um, on the cell, um, is to, to do bit slicing. And it's on a traditional Intel CPU, like on a real high-end machine, um, you get about 64 million keys per second you can that you can try. Or on a six core machine, six times that value, which is 384 million keys per second on a real high-end machi machine. So this is not a random machine that's standing somewhere that you want to recycle. This is a high-end machine that you would buy today. Um, so this is our key space, 56 bits. And 384 million keys per second means that in one second we can walk 28.5 bits. Um, this is, okay, so um, of course this is logarithmic, so it doesn't mean in one second we have half the key space. It means that, well, we still need the remaining um, 27.5, 2 to the power of 27.5 times this second. So um, a day has two to the power of 64 seconds. Um, it's interesting to say it this way because you can just add them up. So you know that you will get 44.9 bits done a day. Um, and if we just leave it running until we reach the end of the key space, it requires us six years to walk the entire key space. And that's on a high-end machine today with a 100% duty cycle running 24-7. So, Six years, I don't know, I'm interested in that key now, and I want it in a week and not in six years. So just leaving it running for a week, there's still some, we won't walk the entire key space in a week, obviously. But we can just use more machines. So we can use 313 machines, approximately. And then we will get our key in a week, which is still not what I want to do. Um, yeah, so the cell, everybody knows about the cell and the PlayStation and so on. So um, the cell SPU can evaluate 128 S-Box lookups in 40 instructions using this bit slicing technology. Um, it's equivalent to 64 cycles per key or 50 million keys per second at 3.2 gigahertz, um, which is about 300 million keys per second per PS3 or... Um, actually 350, thanks to Marken. Um, so it's about as fast as a high-end machine. So it's still not gaining us so much. We could buy 300 PlayStations or 300 PCs. And I'm not sure what the better deal. Okay, GPUs, people are telling me GPUs are fast. They have like m many cores working in parallel. Um, there's a problem. Everybody's using GPUs for MD5 and SHA-1. 
But these are actually, MD5 and SHA-1 are actually optimized to run on ALU-based systems, like on a CPU. DES is optimized to run in hardware, because when it was designed, there was only hardware to run it in. So um, DES is not really suited well for GPUs. You could do the bit slicing thing again. Um, we can estimate it to, like, it's about 10 times as fast as on a single CPU core, like on this high-end CPU core. It would be 640 million keys per second, or 29 or 2 bits. It's still, it still takes a while. So if we put it up here, for the PC, it would cost 313 devices, $150,000 about, if we calculate $500 per node. For the PS3, it's a little bit about what it's supposed to do, but it's encrypted, so we can't really do much here. Um, if you look a little bit closer, you see this repeating 8-byte byte patterns. Um, that's actually a pretty strong indication that they're using a um, non-chaining 8-byte block cipher that will produce the same cipher text for a given 8-byte plain text, and it will repeat that cipher text if you encrypt repeated copy of the plain text. And for this Triforce thing, I don't want to go into the details so much, but we know that the games are encrypted using DES. So the idea is, well, they have a DES hardware, maybe the firmware is encrypted using DES as well. So this was kind of the starting point. I wanted to get this firmware because I'm interested in it. Um, there's no real gain, but I mean, it's a mystery, and I want to solve that mystery. So if we look at the firmware file, do a histogram of eight byte blocks and sort them, uh, we see that there are some duplicate blocks, but there are two distinct ciphertexts that are repeated a lot more often than the other ones. And so the assumption here is that either of these plain texts encrypt to all zero or all FF, because that's a pretty popular pattern in a random binary that's executed. So, yeah, the assumption is that any of those two will decrypt to all zero. <coughs> Um, let's call them C1 and C2. We don't know which one is what. Uh, we only know that they both occur magnitude more often than any other ciphertext in the binary. Um, there's one particular thing here. The Trifos games are actually DS encrypted as said, but they are also byte reversed before and after the encryption. So uh, we have to keep this in mind. If we're looking, if we're brute forcing for a key, we want to be sure that we are looking for the correct um, ciphertext, because otherwise we might miss it because it's byte swapped. Um, so we want to take into account that they might be reversed as well. So um, another interesting thing about DES is the complementation property. It means that if you invert the plain text and